citizens oversight. Okay, they missed that. That's okay. We know it's the uh, August 25th regular meeting of the MWPA Citizens Oversight Committee. I'm going to start with a roll call and we will start with the list. Uh, Kingston Cole. Present. Larry Minicus. Yes, here. Stephen Keese. Here. Here. Okay, Stephen. Lucy Dilworth. Here. Rebecca Suggs. Here. Pat Randolph. Here. Max Perry. Here. Carolyn Longstreet. Here. And myself, Larry Chu. Okay, everybody is here tonight. So uh, next item on the agenda is uh, to see if any of you have anything on the agenda that you want to adjust. I, I already said, Larry, you might not have heard it, but I'm hoping we can whip through the important items first since I'm in Vermont and it's 830 here and I got a half an hour drive to get back to where I'm staying. So. Okay. Um, if that's possible, what I'd like appreciate to do is, it. Uh, still to take public open uh, public open time, and what we can do is skip down to our business items and then do the executive officer report and the committee reports after that. Is that okay? Yeah, I'd appreciate it, Larry. Although I'm sorry to miss Mark's report; it's always interesting. Okay, well, we'll put that in after the uh, business item, yeah. and then. Uh, you can stay for as long as you're up to. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate okay. it. All right. All right. Um, now's the time for open public expression for anybody who's in the audience who would like to comment on items that are not on our agenda tonight, but within our jurisdiction, feel free to uh, raise your hand and the executive officer will let you into the meeting. And I'm looking at our uh, attendee list or with Bruce Bartel, seeing if Bruce raises his hand. And then um, I'll look at Stephen Keese to see if we have uh, um, his partner behind uh, raising her hand. So, <laughs> and right, well, we got a hand, I think that's a wave rather than a hand raise. So um, with that, I don't think we have any public comment. Okay, seeing no public comment, we will now move on and skip the consent calendar for now, skip the committee reports for now and go to, um, I guess, probably the biggest things. Well, you know, it says committee reports, but we'll take item seven as part of the uh, most substantive part of what we need to discuss tonight. So the first item on our agenda is to see if uh, anybody has anything to report out on their monitoring assignments. Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will now move on to item 7B. Uh, that's the uh, Finance Ad Hoc Subcommittee. And uh, hopefully at this point, all of you have had a chance to at least read a general short memo that I had put together for highlighting the things that we need to discuss as we start to build our general framework for uh, doing our review process. So, the way I'm going to start it off is that we already have the finance portion uh, in terms of subcommittees already set up. And as you know, that is, uh, you know, Kingston, uh, Lucy, and uh, Rebecca and myself. No. And at this point, you know, uh, we, we kind of had had a couple meetings, but, you know, we're still in the process of waiting for financial information to be made available for us. Mark, I don't know if you have anything that you'd like to report out or update you know, the committee on in terms of that part of it. We are receiving our uh, reports from our member agencies. Um, uh, some of the re member agencies are re um, reporting a little bit of a delay, which is understandable since this is the first time that we've gone through this and they're still trying to wrap their mind around how they're going to um, report it and then also uh, uh, you know, making their budget centers that they've created for um, the MWPA inflow of funds to be easier to digest and easier to track and be held accountable for, quite frankly, is to, um, setting it up better that way. And then um, 
uh, Elisa is working on closing the books for the core stuff, which is actually relatively easy considering that this last um, budget year that we did not spend a lot on core. So most of it is uh, closing the books with the member agencies. Um, uh, still look to be on track to closing the books at sometime in September. And then um, the auditor is scheduled to be um, a, a showing up in September. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead, Kingston. Yeah, a little little bit of good news. I, I listened, um, I've got a copy of the, the rev, fiscal year 20 uh, revenue and expense report. Looks like we're $9 million ahead of the game, but we have, yeah. we've got a surplus. Which is, I thought, worth mentioning. So yeah, yeah. and and that was uh, purposeful to right. um, yeah. to create that surplus so that we could right. put and have the board decide how much is going to go into a reserve fund for a rainy day type stuff, yeah. and then um, the the remaining would be our bridge funding between July one and December when we get that first tax dump, so we don't have to stop work. Okay, thank you. Uh, would any other members of the uh, finance subcommittee like to uh, comment or report on anything uh, since the last time we've met? I know we haven't had any meetings. Um, one more thing. I just, I read, read, read your, your memo and, and after the meetings, I just wish we had more members. <laughs> we can go out and find some more members. I'd be real happy, Larry. <laughs> this is a lot of work. Yeah, we have a lot of work. <laughs> okay, just a comment. Uh, yeah. Well, um, you know, as a segue to that, uh, you know, in terms of the memo, I, the things I mentioned the last time, I tried to break it up into three broad categories. And the things that, you know, our committee has discussed in terms of what we want to review are, are the work plan. And you know that it that basically is to you know get a sense of what projects are being worked on. Are they within compliance and within the uh, enabling legislation in terms of the type of work that they're doing? And you know, quite possibly, the committee may want to go out and take a look at you know the, those sites. You know, basically take a field trip. So that's going to be one committee. There's going to be a second one to evaluate the transparency in terms of how the MWPA conducts his business. So really what you're asking is, you know, are we following best practices in open government and reporting, um, you know, all the things that, you know, we need to in order to be effective and so that the public has the information, you know, they need um, and, and would be asking for. So, you know, part of our reporting process is part of that, but there are also other committees and subcommittees and the, and the board in general, which have all their uh, meetings. And, you know, that's the question you'll need to ask and answer, you know, are, are we keeping good records? And is that information available to the public? Uh, the third thing, of course, is the actual presentation of the annual report. And, you know, that's kind of more of a production type of thing. So you know, what type of content are we looking for? Uh, what's the design and the layout gonna look like? You know, and then what's our target audience gonna be? And if uh, we do have a distribution, you know, how do we get it out to those people within our audience? So those are just kind of like the bullets and the highlights of it. Um, you know, I'll pause here for a moment and see if there are anything, any things that, you know, committee members would say might need another subcommittee or something that I've left out. And as Kingston said, it's already a lot of work. So Larry, uh, thanks to you and the, um, and, and all the members, Kingston and everyone else for, for your work on this. Um, for the kind of financial part, is that is that subcommittee essentially, uh, Larry Kingston and uh, Lucy already set up, and then these are additional subcommittees, or are these subcommittees of the subcommittee that is you guys? Well, you know, I had always considered them separate subcommittees, all with all the who are working in the process of trying to produce the annual report. And I don't want to create another level of hierarchy. <laughs> so, no subcommittees of the subcommittees. That's, That's right. right. Okay. And I just want to make a correction, 
uh, Stephen is a member of the finance subcommittee, not me. Oh, okay. Uh, that's right. You're 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 the uh, vice chair now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so sorry, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, Larry. So Larry, we need a work plan subcommittee as well. To work. Um, as yeah, because the, the work plan will not be evaluating finances, nor will the finance committee be looking at the work plan. The work plan, I thought, would target specifically the projects. Okay. All right. Well, I can volunteer for that committee yeah i would be in i would be you know willing to help with that aspect i guess i'm a little confused what you just said larry how is the work plan evaluation going to fit in with our annual report good question well if if i were to treat them as separate categories the finance portion is supposed to address whether the money was spent in accordance to the measure C. Uh huh. Right. And, and um, in in large part, that's what the work plan committee will be looking at as well. Because when you look at all the different projects, you know this this subcommittee would I envision actually looking at the projects and if they want to go out and validate you know that the work is being done you know that that's you know that that's some of the feedback that we had gotten from committee members before as we were discussing our roles and responsibilities originally i had thought that it would be combined together because i didn't see us going out and actually doing field trips and, and, and looking at the projects. But if there are some, yes, Rebecca. There's also the, what you had mentioned earlier is looking at the projects and saying, are they new work that wasn't already being done by the jurisdictions? So in other words, uh, MWPA money is supposed to be for new stuff. So mm -hmm. we should be reviewing that. And then also reviewing, are these projects within the scope of MWPA, Measure C, you know, not something that's not, shouldn't be covered by Measure C money. So is, it, is the money being spent on a project that should be being spent on? So there's this fine line between the dollars uh, in the finance subcommittee and then there's the work plan that it's being spent on. Yes, and, and I could see the two committees actually working pretty close yeah. together, but when the finance committee met the first time, you know, we were really struggling with all the different tasks that would have to be done. You know, especially, you know, Rebecca, what you just said about um, looking at the individual jurisdictions and you know, who, who was going to gather and, and um, you know, say, get the attestations. And, you know, I don't, we, we really don't know how we're going to go about that process. And it's probably going to need more discussion with, um, you know, Mark and staff, but there would be some kind of reporting back from the cities. But this, you know, people reviewing the projects might want to pick one or two or three cities on a rotation or not cities, but, you know, members of the MWPA to see if, you know, their projects are not new projects, as you've said, and or are new projects and not something that, you know, they're back backfilling or putting additional funds into. Yeah, uh, Pat. Yeah, you know, I have a thought on, um, that just popped into my head on, uh, when we're talking about that, verifying that uh, this is new money, um, five of us represent geographic areas. And maybe it would make sense for those of us who represent geographic areas to look at the projects of the area they represent. Uh, and I would imagine that most of us have some sort of relationship with uh, the 
the, you know, I know I have no Chief White and uh, Rachel Kurtz and Quinn Gardner and the other people. Mm -hmm. So it might be logical and I'll bet you Rebecca has relationship with Bill Tyler and- um, Careful. careful. Uh, <laughs> Not that kind of relationship. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's just a thought that maybe maybe that is a good role for the, the geographic representatives to be looking at how the money is being spent in their own geographic area. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good idea. Mm. Yeah, uh, Larry? Uh, one complication is not all of us will be on the subcommittee. So it's tasking people that aren't on the subcommittee to, to also do the report. And Larry, I think where you were going kind of is there's going to be a lot of projects and we probably won't be able to look at all of them in any given year. And, and maybe as you're suggesting, you do a spot check, you, you, you pick a district, you look at two or three projects that they've done and, and you pick three, three districts and, and you go around like that to get kind of an idea if things are working as they're supposed to be working. It might be just a bit too much, and Mark could respond to this, a bit too much to try and follow every project that's going to be done in a given year. It, it, Mark, we're gonna to get to core projects, the big ones, in two or three years. I mean, that seems to me when this, this particular function will be most vital. I mean, it's fine to go out and check in various townships and villages or whatever, and even San Rafael, but the, the core projects, about, the big ones are coming up. That's the, the, we're starting this fiscal year um, spending money on core projects. Okay, all right. That's what I, you know, I would, certainly a focus. It wouldn't be by by city or town or by by region or area. So, okay. Yeah, the, the well, money we're talking about right now is the uh, local control money. Right. You know what okay. goes out to the city. yeah, the twenty percent. Yeah, yeah. Stephen, I thought you might want to look like you wanted to say something. David, Jen, <laughs> <laughs> turn it on. <laughs> so muted. Uh, this happens okay. all well, the you, time. If you yeah. did, you're still on mute. Uh, there he is. I'm just saying I was uh, supporting Pat and 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 uh, other comments of the people we're making because I think that we're we're getting ourselves organized well. Okay, so. Um, you know, when we, we talk about the work plan thing, I think one of the things that, uh, you know, the subcommittee also needs to do is, you know, work with Mark or whatever member, oh, he's only got one other member of his staff right now, who, you know, if to, to put together that attestation process, you know, Mark may have already done it. I, I don't know, Mark, do you, how far have you gotten with that? Or have you had discussion? Uh, just verbals, nothing, nothing in writing. Yeah. So, you know, as, as part of our review process, you know, we'll, we'll need to at least come up with a, a simple set of requirements for that in terms of even as simple as, okay, well, who has to sign off on it? Is it just going to be the uh, city manager, executive officer, or do we want the elected chair also? Or and do, Yeah, Rebecca. And do we know whether the auditors are doing any of that kind of work? Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I would have to believe that's not in the purview of their audit. But they'd just be looking mm -hmm. at the finances, yeah. the dollar finances and internal controls. I would. I wouldn't bet again. They might be doing a spot check if they're a good auditor. So they do a TAM. So, oh, huh, okay. What What are you asking them to do, Mark? We, um, I got to look, I'll be honest with you, I haven't looked at that contract in quite some time. And so um, this will be a conversation I'll have with the auditors when they come in in September. Okay. Um. All right, that, that sounds good. So, um, you know, I don't know if anybody wants to discuss anything about, uh, you know, just checking up on things that are transparency related or you know, putting together the annual report, but I don't, I don't know, we, I can just take it at this point a show of hands and just see what people are interested in volunteering for. And then we'll see if we have, 
you know, if we have at least two people like in each committee, I guess we right. can call it a subcommittee. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll just be an individual effort. So who wants to work on the work plan? Otherwise, we'll have Mark draw straws again. Okay, well, that's pretty good. We got Larry. So we have as well. already volunteered for that, I think. But did we not did we not think about doing it by the geog geographic rep doing it? Well, um, I'm a geographic rep and I could probably get you in touch with people. I don't know how much time I'll be able to spend on two committees. And one, one, one drawback to the using all of the geographical reps, then you would be having five. And so therefore you would have a quorum. Maybe we could do the geographic reps and leave Larry out. Okay, uh, I don't remember who I think. I'm on, you know, I, I honestly think that the finance subcommittee has expertise in the finance area to be reviewing all of it, you know, and the geographic, I, I think it doesn't sound efficient to me to have each one of us kind of, you know, reinventing the wheel and what we're supposed to be doing. Maybe uh, what so the uh, finance committee can do is to let the work group, work plan subcommittee know what it is that they, they need, because what we don't have is the bandwidth to be able to to talk to the members on their projects and, and also be looking at the finances. You know, that, that's what we realized in our first meeting was that it was gonna to be too much work. Yeah, uh, one suggestion, maybe one member from, from the finance subcommittee should also be on the work plan committee. So we have that, that liaison between the two. Yeah, that might be a good thing. I mean, yeah. I'm still a little unclear on what the work plan committee's charge is. We talked about making sure that it's new money or new projects, but I, I, I'd have to go back to our bylaws. I thought there was going to be a little more sub, you know, substantive or you know, norm, whatever the word is. We're going to be evaluating whether the projects are well thought out and whether they're being carried out well and you know not so much strictly limited to the financial aspect but i don't know maybe i'm wrong about that well larry that was one of the things that you had mentioned early on was um you know you wanted to take a look at whether the projects in and of themselves were meeting the objectives of you know the broad mandate of you know, the MWPA and Measure C, uh -huh. you know, and yes, that would fall within the work of the work, the, the work of the work plan committee as well. Okay. Yeah. Now, in That's terms of overlap, me. I guess of the four hands that I saw, I don't know, if Rebecca, you, you were the, you raised your hand and you're on finance committee. So, you know, are you okay serving on two committees? I think I think so. Well, the reason I raised my hand is because I am a geographic rep, and I was thinking we were going to do that. But I think I'm also okay being on the finance and work plan. Okay, uh, who are the geographic reps? I don't have that in front of me. Uh, I I represent Southern Marin, and I'd be happy to happy to serve on it. Okay, so we got Carolyn, Rebecca, Pat, and and um and max is that correct because i would be the fifth yeah okay so the four of you then would be on the work plan subcommittee all right um i don't know we took a we took a formal vote on this the last time with the finance committee so uh, i'll entertain a motion to appoint uh Carolyn, Max, Pat, and Rebecca to the work plan subcommittee. So moved. Second. second. And a second. About, one. Okay, just oh. just question. I mean, Larry Minicus volunteered to be on oh, it. Okay. 
I've got I've got plenty of committees. Okay. <laughs> I was doing that because I I heard Larry say we need someone to step up, so I was stepping up. Okay, it's, okay. it's perfectly okay. 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 At this point, I have a motion and a second. I want to check to see if there are any members of the audience who would like to comment on uh, this one proposed action. And we do have a raised hand with uh, Bruce. Bruce to. Okay, uh, Bruce, go ahead. Hi there. Hi, welcome. Um, thank you. Um, I've, I'm addressing particularly the part of the attestation, which I think is an important part of the process. But as we saw when we were first setting things up, people have a lot of uh, misinterpretations of what their local funds are allowed to do. And I think an innocent mistake in attestations could easily be made. And I think it's important to follow up on those, um, particularly on the really active districts like San Rafael and Nevado. Uh, so I hope that that's gonna be included uh, actively in following up on, uh, and not just taking attestations at face value. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, um... You know, again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this this committee will be working with, um, you know, markers designate to come up yeah. with the attestation letter. You know, so um, yeah, thank you for your comments, Bruce, and we'll, we'll de definitely take that into consideration. And, and and Larry, if I could just, I want to clarify. I know the minutes will get this, but I want to make sure my notes are right. Uh, Carolyn, Rebecca, Max, and Carolyn, or excuse me, not Carolyn. Um, that's why Pat. I'm asking. Pat. Um, Pat. Pat. Yeah. Pat. Carolyn, you're so good. I put you down twice. <laughs> right. Okay. Was uh, Bruce the only member of the public? Yes, sir. Okay. So. We have a motion by Stephen, second by Larry. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, aye. any opposed? All right. Oh. That, that, uh, thank you for yeah. your, your service on the work plan subcommittee. Uh, and, uh, Al Al Alfie voted no, but we're not going to count it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, we used to have a cat in the Larkspur City <laughs> Council Chambers who used to walk around in the front of the dais, and, and he was kind of like the, the, the sixth member of the, uh, of the council. Yeah. <laughs> okay um uh, to to be clear alfie was voting for me not to be on that committee for, <laughs> for last but he session. got overruled <laughs> <laughs> okay so now we have um you know people who are going to review the transparency of the mwpa uh any anyone want to volunteer for that yeah okay we have kingston lucy and stephen Anyone else at this time? I guess I can. Okay, that makes four. All right, so um, we have Kingston, Lucy, Larry, and Stephen. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion to appoint them to a transparency subcommittee? Uh, I'll make the motion. Okay, we have Max with a motion. I'll second. Carolyn with a second. I will now open this up to Mr. Bartell, and if anyone else has <laughs> joined from members of the public who would like to comment on this item. Stephen, you can't second yourself to be on the committee, by the way. <laughs> oh, I can't. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, doesn't sound I, like I don't I don't see any I don't see Bruce raising his hand on this one. <laughs> okay, no hands up. Then I will uh, ask for anyone all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? There's a dog again. Uh, that was Alf, but that was Alfie barked on the eye that time. Yeah. Know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Thank you for uh, four of you for serving on the uh, transparency subcommittee, and uh, that leaves the subcommittee to basically help with content design and layout, and to uh, work with staff to determine what the distribution is and how that distribution will occur. Okay. Distribution um, of what exactly? Uh, I'm sorry? What, what do you mean distribute? You mean how it'll be 
how much goes into each section or I'm not clear on what you mean. Um, once we identify, you know, who, you know, who does it go to in the public, um, then we'll have to figure out how we get it there. You know, is it going to be electronic? Is it going to be on paper? And we have a nice kind of glossy magazine, like, you know, some of the JPAs do like TAM and stuff like that. Right. And, you know, we'll actually have to have, uh, you'll have to have a conversation with with Mark to see how much is budgeted for that process for production as well as for the mailings themselves. So I volunteer for that. I volunteer for that too. Okay, Lucy, Pat, and yeah, Kingston. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're fine with three people for that, and if somebody else would like to join that a little bit later, um, you know, we can add them in since we can have up to four people. Something so, very slick, four colors. I got, we got it going here. <laughs> and, and doesn't presentation also mean coming up with the uh, executive summary and doing that before the board and doing a, uh, yeah. a PowerPoint and, a, and. Well, working with staff. Yeah. Yeah. Big, a big, a big production. Camping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we, there are plenty of examples out there. And I think several uh, committee members have suggested things and sent stuff out. So, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You, you, yeah. you can also be as, um, let's just say, as, as simple as what I've seen some jurisdictions do, which is nothing more than a one or two page summary that looks like it was typed up in a memo form. So not going to happen. Not going to happen. Okay. <laughs> this, this, this is Moran. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I, I think, I personally think somewhere in between, right. because if it's too slick, I always distrust it. Yeah. And if it's too simple, it looks like they didn't put in the work. So there's mm -hmm. a sweet spot. Yeah. I, do, I do think we may get people who really do want to see it around the state, the same jurisdictions that are asking what's the MWPA doing and how are you doing it and are you successful and I think those people are going to be interested too. Yeah and Mark you know if things you know things are clearly on the path of being successful at least in this first year you know if you could use it as promotional materials for grant writing and stuff like that too. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so um, we have Kingston, Lucy, and Pat. Uh, can I have a motion to appoint them to an annual report subcommittee? I'll move. Okay, Max. Anyone second? And Larry, second. All right, I'm going to open it up to um, any members of the public who are still online and see if they have any comments they'd like to make about this item. Looking for. Uh... One virtual hand and one hand behind Stephen's head. So um, I don't see either. So <laughs> okay. So we're close off public comment. Take it back to the committee for um, a vote on this. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Is do we have an extension back there, Max? <laughs> um, he's gone to sleep. So oh, he's gone to sleep. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Understandable. <laughs> good right. dog. Good dog. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, thank you. What I will uh, ask each of the groups to do is, uh, you know, between now and the next meeting, see if you can get yourself together and figure out how you're going to organize yourself by all means. Uh, you know, I, I don't think with the people with four are going to be able to come to me or Lucy to, you know, uh, discuss anything that you're doing but you know certainly uh if you have questions about st structure or what you're trying to accomplish uh you know you can talk to mark about that okay so uh we are going to close off now item number 7b and looks like carolyn is still with us yeah but thanks that was great i really appreciate you skipping to that item okay well, just so that um, you have an opportunity to have your voice heard, um, I'm just going to jump back up to item number six, which is the consent calendar. 
And the only item on the consent calendar this time was approval or minutes from the last meeting. But anyway, Larry, if I could um, interject one thing real quick. Um, yes. a, a mistake in the minutes was identified. Thank you, Lucy. And that was under the part um, that is actually the information agenda, um, information item agenda item that we have tonight. And um, operations committee was missed out of the listing of the three committees that um, you guys will be discussing today. I thought I had caught, captured that. So we will add operations committee to that uh, along with giving the COC the opportunity to comment. Okay. Um, would any other members of the committee or members of the public like to pull the um, item on the consent calendar, the agenda, or not the agenda, the minutes from the last meeting for further discussion? No. Okay, uh, seeing none and hearing none, uh, I will take a motion to approve the consent calendar as modified. There was some move. Okay, Kingston. I'll second. Kingston and Carolyn. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. The consent calendar passes unanimously. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm being really informal here. Carolyn, would you prefer to hear the executive officer's report first or to go to our informational items? I'd like to hear Mark's report, actually. Okay. I mean, so, it hasn't even been an hour yet, so I'm hanging in there for now. All right. So now we will move to item number five, which is the report from the executive officer. All yours, Mark. All right. Well, uh, good evening. I hope it's. I hope it gets up to Carolyn's uh, expectations tonight. <laughs> um, and, I'll let you know. Believe me. All right. Um, I'm gonna. You know, I, I'm afraid I'm gonna start getting like a. a, a um, a broken drum and, and, or, and hitting the same drum, but the, you know, the fire updates just, there, there's nothing pretty about them. Um, when I look at the updates today, we have seven um, incidents, have incident management teams assigned to them. And again, that, that's one of those barometers that I use to look at state drawdown. And um, out of the seven incidents, only three of them are under a hundred thousand acres. Wow. And, and those are um, 20,000 acres, which used to be a huge fire. Um, 70,000 acres and 88,000 acres. So they're not very much smaller than 100,000 acres. And we have the Dixie fire at 750 about. So um, it just, that's a, just a tremendous amount of drawdown. And then today we've had four new fires emerge that have the potential to go with what we call extended attack, if not major attack. Um, one of them is in Nevada, um, what's called the Nevada Yuba Placer Unit for Cal Fire. And three of them are down in Southern California in San Bernardino, the Tuolumne Calaveras and Riverside counties. So um, that's the scary thing is that when you already have the, um, you know, large enough incidents that have already sucked in a bunch of resources, um, it, it, it strips some of the initial attack resources, but we, the fire managers do a really good job of balancing and making sure that we still have initial attack strength. Because the last thing we need when we have seven large incidents is a couple more large incidents. So we try and stomp on them while they're small. Um, the Caldor fire continues to be a, a, a concern for everybody um, being in such an important corridor and making it and potentially getting to South Lake Tahoe. And I mean, we looked at the Dixie thinking it started near Paradise and the idea of it reaching um, uh, Chester and Lake Almanor was like, wow, that. I doubt that's going to happen. Well, it did and, and went beyond it. So there's there's no telling if the Caldor is going to do that. Fortunately, weather has been um, helping them on that. Um, and then just, just really briefly, and I think some of the messaging that we're going to start working on with the MWPA is that I'm concerned that we are creating an environment of fear in, in our communities. And people don't make well, good decisions from a position of fear. And I would really like to start creating, it's an environment of concern rather than an environment of fear. And then um, along those same lines, lucky versus unlucky. I, I very frequently hear when there's a fire that was three acres and um, the initial attack resources did a great job of containing that fire at three acres. I hear, wow, we were really lucky. And I think that if people have that mindset that they were lucky, 
then it, and Anne's the one that pointed this out to me, it, it really gives them a sense of helplessness that it re, they had to rely on luck for that to occur. Well, um, let's look at our suppression resources. 97% uh, of the time we hold our fires 10 acres or less in Marin County. 99.5% of the time we hold our fires um, to the point where there's no st structure damage. So when you have that high of a success rate, it's no longer luck. Part of it is the, the effective um, response that we have, but other parts of it is, is the work that we've been doing. I, I'll, I'll use um, this, the fire near Larry's house, Larry and Kingston's house. It hit um, uh, uh, work that had been done by San Rafael Fire with some with them, the WPA funding, some without. And that significantly helped the suppression of that fire and kept it small. Let's go to last year in Larkspur and um, a fire that occurred that hit um, excellent defensible space um, and that helped. And so that was a resident taking action. So um, we can help create that environment. We're not gonna stop fires today and we are gonna have massive fires, but at least we can perhaps modify the fire behavior to save lives and um, um, limit structure loss. And so I want people to think that we were unlucky when we didn't succeed. Um, and it, it gives, and now we can't control mother nature, I get that. And when mother nature decides the fire is gonna burn, the fire is gonna burn, but perhaps we can at least protect our residents and our homes. Um, our, I think our um, communication strategy, um, it's taken a while for it to gain some traction, but I think it is gaining some traction um, with the, and I, I looked at the IJ article, editorial today. Um, I don't know if all of you have gotten a chance to see that editorial, but I actually thought that I, they never called me about that editorial. So, um, and I really appreciated the messaging and I agree with the messaging that was in that editorial. And it really uh, focused towards the resident and the responsibilities that the residents have. And, and um, then kind of turned the lens on the MWPA, which I'm completely good with. And that is the MWPA needs to be helping the residents and providing resources to the residents to do what they need to harden their homes and provide to um, create defensible space. But the MWPA also needs to do some work ourselves with vegetation management projects in and around our communities to keep those communities safe. And, and I, um, I feel that we are up to that task. Um, those of you that um, watched the board meeting um, earlier uh, this month, you saw that we cr are creating, we haven't created, we haven't got the membership yet, uh, but Bruce and I have been strategizing on the membership for a strategic ad hoc subcommittee and a governance ad hoc subcommittee. I'll start with the governance one, that's the easier one to decide the, or to, to describe, excuse me. The JPA language and the tax ordinance language is really um, silent when it comes to how we select the, the president of the board, the vice president of the board, and how we develop them into or, or go through that process, the voting process. So the governance committee is going to look at how we, um, we vote, how we have a succession plan like you guys have that the vice chair is going to move into the chair. None of that language is in our JPA or our bylaws. So that's one of the things they're going to look at that and also look at, um, you know, with a newly emerging organization that we were and, and having no staff at all, the board needed to be much more hands-on than the typical board of a, a joint powers agreement. And so um, Bruce has put together a great plan of how to transition from that governance model of developing the organization to the governance model of a built out organization. And you know their roles are gonna be a little bit different. So that's what the governance subcommittee is gonna be looking at. Strategic sub ad hoc subcommittee is gonna be looking at, all right, how are we gonna, what is our strategy to get our um, um, work done? What's our strengths? Basically, we're gonna go through a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats and work with staff to put together um, the solutions to the, the, that SWAT, use the strengths and, and opportunities to balance out the weaknesses and threats. And um, staff and I, and <laughs> it sounds funny, Ann and I, but, just, um, <laughs> but also our, um, we have some amazing um, contractors on that I feel are our staff members. And that's uh, uh, Gene Bonander, uh, Bill Keen, uh, Megan Asafito as our counsel and Charlotte Jordan and then Elisa Schiffman. And we had a um, offsite strategic planning session on Monday. We spent uh, three hours um, 
and had just a well-framed set of questions. It was really a SWOT analysis and all that information that we did is to that for that is going to be passed along to that strategic ad hoc subcommittee of the board to help guide where we're moving forward. Um, on the operations side, uh, we're continuing to work through all of our environmental compliance um, and we are getting projects going. We have the, um, as we know, the, the um, herbivory or goat grazing going on in San Rafael. We've had some uh, work along um, some of the fire roads in San Rafael. Uh, Central Marin Fire is working on um, escape route um, uh, clearing and improvements. And some of our local agencies are um, getting well engaged with their projects, either going through the compliance process or getting the projects up and running. I'm excited about where our grant program is moving. Um, this is, uh, I've had Charlotte Jordan working on that. And she is working hard um, to streamline the process, both for staff, because that'll decrease costs on the staff time, but also make it that much easier for residents and going through a process that after they get their evaluation, it'll lead them right into what types of grants that they're available for them. And they'll answer a few key questions at the entry of it. And it'll say, okay, based on where you live and based on this information, these are the grant programs that you're available for. And then it'll go through a process that has checks and balances with our staff or our member agency staff, but it really will be automated and decrease the amount of staff time to get those grants submit, um, approved and, and funded. And then Zone Haven, um, we just distributed the training video for our public safety officers uh, today, and they're, I asked them to get that pushed out through all the training officers so that the field personnel have all seen that training video within a week and a half. And then um, we are putting the final touches on the, the public facing Know Your Zone campaign and the three goals of those videos for the, uh, the public and the Know Your Zone campaign is number one is the let the public know that we have a plan. And I think that's been a lot of um, part of the fear factor is that the, um, without us displaying, us being the public safety officials displaying to our public that we have a plan in absence of that information, there were a lot of residents that felt that we did not have a plan. And when you look throughout the the, the catastrophes that happen through the state, it's not unfair for the residents to think if we hadn't broadcasted what our plan was for them to think that there wasn't a plan. So part of it is going to be broadcasting that we have a well-oiled plan. The, the second component is Alert Marin still, we are still pounding that Alert Marin drum. That is the number one way for us to get that message out. And then the last piece is going to be to know what zone you live in. And the reason why we want, and maybe you've heard me say this before, but the reason why we want people to know what zone they're in is that it helps with that situational awareness. And you hear, you see a Nixle that says a fire is happening on White's Hill and you live in um, Fairfax and you can look, I see your eyes go big there, Stephen. Um, you, can, you can look and see that um, all right, wow, we, they just put um, Baywood Canyon in an evacuation order. And um, uh, Lefty Gomez, I'm, I'm having a mental block on the community just right by Lefty Gomez Field, but, and they're in a warning. And I'm that next zone to the west or to the east of that. So maybe I should start park, packing my bag before I even get the evacuation warning notice. So it, we are really using that as a tool to help keep our public situationally aware. And then once the evacuations have been made, the number one question that comes to public safety officials is, when can we go back? And um, being one of those evacuees, and um, you, you are constantly looking at the website that has the information and being able to see that information really helps keep the public informed of when they can come back in. And so with that, I'll um, go back to you guys with any questions. We got uh, Lucy, Carolyn, and Kingston. Uh, go ahead, Lucy. I have a couple of questions. Um, firstly, the um, Know Your Zone campaign it would make tremendous sense for you to work with FireSafe Marin, who can then work with the FireWise leaders so that every community knows exactly what zone they're in. 
um, and that's a perfect way to reach down to the ground. Yep. Um, and um, the uh, yeah, so that I mean that that would make perfect sense for every Firewise community to be saying. By the way, we are in whatever zone. Um, the next thing that I wanted to raise was um, it would be very helpful for residents to know, um, and I think it might be a way of prompting more participation, if we had a regular announcement of how many, what percentage of Marinites are signed up for Alert Marin. I know that this would be, you'd have to coordinate with the Office of Emergency Services, um, but they might be able to give you um, a fairly, at, you know, precise count of a percentage, maybe not broken down by district, but maybe broken down by district, so that um, each jurisdiction knows what percentage of their residents are signed up. And that could be passed on to the Firewise communities and they can know how many of their people are. So I, those seem to be sort of uh, two very uh, quick ways of getting people motivated and understanding what's going on. And um, if, uh, for your first point, uh, yes, we were side by side with Fire Safe Marin in our media campaign, as well as every public information officer with every one of our member agencies. Good. So um, yeah, and FireWise communities is definitely a target, um, as are our, our um, NRGs, um, because they they really have the the ear of our public. So um, and then I'm I'm I'll, I'll after the meeting I'll dig up. The, we actually did receive the stats from the um, yeah. County Office of Emergency Services of uh, where they feel the um, Alert Marin signups are. It's it's a, a little bit of a difficult um, stat to produce, but they are working on it. Um, and it's it's actually pretty high finally but there obviously still is room to, to improve. One of the things that really helped was that we were able to get um, phone information from, we being public safety, um, phone information from our utilities. Oh. And, and that increased our enrollment. And then they forced the enrollment in. Based on that data, they forced those, that enrollment into Alert Moran. And that had like a 20% increase in our enrollment. Great, that's great news. Hey, uh, Carolyn and then Kingston. Yeah, Mark, can you explain more how the public is going to be uh, made familiar with Zone Haven? You mentioned some videos, but it didn't sound like they were quite ready for the public. You know, can you go over that again? Sure. The, pub, the public video is all but done. We just have to, or we're just doing the very, very final editing and we look to issue um, a, a massive uh, a public media campaign that includes uh, a press release reaching out to our print and um, radio and TV media, um, as well as um, using all of our connections within our public safety agencies for that video to go out. It's a, um, a soft launch for September. And then in April, we will be going through a much more intense uh, media campaign that will include, um, like for instance, uh, the, the banner that's in Fairfax on Sir Francis Drake, the um, sides of Golden Gate Bridge District buses talking about Zone Haven. And so mm -hmm. um, the April rollout will be much more um, thorough than it is in September. The good news is that um, we're still ahead of the curve of a lot of areas. In, in rolling out Zone Haven prior to a fire. Most agencies haven't gotten to the point. Most agencies, Zone Haven has been implemented after the fire ignited. Mm. Okay. We don't want that. No. Yeah. So is it going to be on the MWPA website or we're going to get, it'll be, get it through? Our it'll be everywhere. It's, okay. It'll All be right. everywhere. Thank you. Look forward to seeing it. Hey, Kingston. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to write a letter, Mark. I should have done it already about what a fantastic job everybody did on that three acre fire on my hill. I mean, it really, I mean, the shaded field breaks and everything that were already up there basically saved Graceland. Okay. It just, it didn't come down that way, but you, you fought it well. And it was, there were still people up there a couple of days ago. So. And, um, 
you know, um, San Rafael Fire has always been, throughout my entire career, has been a quality organization that does a fantastic job. And um, some of the law enforcement agencies have had difficulty wrapping their minds around Incident Command System and Unified Command. San Rafael PD has been one of their early people that really um, bought into the value of Unified Command. And um, at the command post, there was San Rafael PD and San Rafael right. Fire standing side by side, and 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 it was an excellent example of unified command. That that's why we put them both in the same safety building. Right? Yep. <laughs> Police on one side, and the fire on the other. Uh, some, sometimes that <laughs> makes it worse, though, Kingston. Yeah. <laughs> the, the lines. I was just down there. The lines going into the police side were about eight times longer than ones going. People going in the fire side. Well, just remember, the firefighters get the five fingered wave. I'll just leave the rest unsaid. Okay. <laughs> All right. You got it. Harry, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah I'll just say because I was looking on Pulse Point during the fire, and there was 14, 15, 16 pieces of equipment that were called yeah. to the fire, which made me think, well, they've they're throwing everything at it. It's not, you know, you never saw really tall flames. You saw a little bit of flaming, but it, they never really rose where it got. It, it was frightening. Anytime you have a fire near your home, it's always frightening. But you, you, there was a certain comfort level seeing all that equipment coming really, really quick. Yeah. There were embers and, that came over the top of the hill, though. I yeah. talked with neighbors on the other side because right. the wind shifted them up. It was it was frightening, and yeah. there were you know flames. Um, and 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 to give you an idea of that response that Larry was mentioning that he saw on Pulse Point on a what we call a medium dispatch day which is 90 percent of the time in the summer the county marines in a medium dispatch if it's in a local fire jurisdiction as well as in the state responsibility area or a threat to the state responsibility area you have 22 pieces of equipment either either driving or flying to that fire wow. on initial dispatch yeah they all went by my house Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> with their siren all completely wound up right <laughs> no. how did it start does any, do they know how it started? Yeah. Still under investigation. Yeah. Not, likely not homeless, Yeah, likely homeless because there's no other ignition source down there. Well, they 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 just said it wasn't a natural source. Yeah, right. there wasn't. And lightning, they're leaving. Lightning and power lines have been ruled out. That's well, right. You got it. Yeah. Right. Hey, we have uh, Pat and then Lucy. Uh, just a quick comment on the, uh, I'm kind of on the other side of San Rafael Hill, the peaceful side, because I slept through the whole thing. Uh, but I was interested in some of the confusion of what people's expectations are uh, on next door the next day, uh, that there's still some definitely education to be done uh, someone was commenting that there was no one to lead us down the hill. Um, and uh, I thought that was uh, uh, interesting. And I'm not quite sure what my expectations are, but uh, I think paying close attention to social media uh, can, can be very useful to let you know when the public is not perceiving things quite as they should be. Yeah, and um, next door is one of those ones. I don't know if we can ever um, win <laughs> yeah. that battle. And um, I'll be as quick as I can about next door. Uh, two years ago, we had a structure fire in Fairfax that extended into an eighth of an acre of grass. And we did not want anybody to evacuate. Prior to our first engine getting at scene, there were 12 next door posts and people were self evacuating. Um, they were blocking the ingress for the fire engines. A person ran over himself as the car moved as he was, and a TV fell out of a car that they were, I, why you would evacuate and rescue your TV. Anyway, but, um, and the engine company had to move the TV out of the way so that oh, they can do the fire. Sorry. And it was a, it was an incident that we didn't want them to evacuate for. So yeah, Pat, um, message well received. Yes. <laughs> Hey, Lucy. Um, I was just wondering um, about aircraft because there really is only one um, sort of fleet of aircraft and with nine major fires going on in the state. Um, what do you think it's, what, with, with the possibility of one breaking out in Marin? I mean, is it, are they going to be stretched too thin? Is it the sort of thing that we, we could get our time with the, with the planes? 
That's that's an excellent question. So the vast majority of the aircraft that we use in, in California is CAL FIRE aircraft. Mm -hmm. There are nine Hell Attack bases and 22 fixed wing tankers that are um, available. And CAL FIRE's policy is the new and emergent, emerging fire is the priority for the aircraft. So let's say we have the CAL door fire, okay? And we have um, six fixed wing that are working on working on that fire. This and then Sonoma air attack base is our air attack base. Let's say for for sake of argument, there's only one tanker on that base. Mm. They will call the cow door and say, you must release one one of your tankers to come to Marin. To get, so because our our standard dispatch is, is one air attack. That's the guy that's flying around controlling the aircraft, two tankers and one copter. So they will pull um, that they will get for this example that we'll get the one tanker that's at a Sonoma air attack and they'll call the cow door and say you must release one of your tankers and it's without question that tanker pulls out of orbit heads over to Marin and we get our tanker that's in the perfect world um, last year was a great example of the not perfect world and um, there were so many incidents um, during the lightning siege that um, I tried for like three or four hours straight on the phone talking to the North Ops, which is the Geographical Area Coordination Center, to try to get aircraft on our quarter acre fire, the Woodward fire. And um, I couldn't, it, you know, that's where they get into that prioritization and we were not a high enough priority to get the aircraft. And I'm, I'm fairly convinced that I gotten aircraft that first day, it probably wouldn't have burned 5,000 acres. Oh, really? Well, we did eventually get the super scoopers. <laughs> they were a big yeah. hit locally. Yeah. <laughs> so even, but Lucy, to, to put you at a little bit more at ease, even in in um, today's environment with these large fires going, if, if Marin broke a new fire, they would get the full aircraft complement. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments they'd like to make to Mark? All right, seeing none. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I just have a quick question, which this is sort of slightly out of order that it's something I probably should have put up when we were talking about uh, monitoring assignments. Um, at the board meeting, uh, and I think at the executive committee too, there was a little bit of discussion that that I wrote down in my notes sounds like um, uh, added staff or new positions. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that Mark and uh, Anne are overworked. Uh, but I just wonder when both consultants, legal and actual employees, we are watching to see that administrative costs stay under the, uh, they just, that always, um, because I know the grand jury report envisioned a very lean, mean organization with very little staff. And every time I hear about uh, anything that implies more positions, I, uh, my ears open up and I get curious. Yeah, and when and we are looking at that, and um, what still needs to be de um, de defined is, um, and it's it's really poorly defined in the JPA language what administrative costs are, yeah. and for you know I'll make the argument that personnel that are going to be in the field they're going to be working side by side with the crews, making sure that they are doing exactly what that project outlined. I would, I would argue that is not an administrative cost, that is an operational cost to make. So that's the type of uh, where that line in the sand of administrative costs versus operational costs still needs to be decided. Um, at this point, uh, for the people that are being employed by the MWPA, we're erring on the side of calling them all administrative, except for the contractors are actually going and doing the work. And we are well below that 10%. Okay. You would would Cal Fire by a model of how they uh, classify this? Would would that be a useful model, or is it two different I, I I tried um, and tried looking at their def both um, Cal Fire and federal grants. Mm -hmm. um, looking at their definition of administrative cost, there is some applicability, but not complete. 
Okay, uh, any other questions or comments for Mark tonight? I'm gonna be signing off guys. So thank you for readjusting the agenda. Uh, I'm sorry it worked out the way it did for me tonight, but um, I'll see you in a few weeks. Okay, thanks for joining us on the East. Thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Okay, That's thanks, bye-bye. Right, if uh, the committee doesn't have anything else, I wanna see if there's any members of the public who are still on who would like to ask our executive officer any questions about his report. And I'm looking for raised hands and don't see any. Okay, so we'll close off um, that item on our agenda. So now we're moving down to number eight, which are informational items. So that is where we will get any reports associated with um, the different committees, executive, finance, and operations. And um, maybe if I could kick it off and hand it off to you, Lucy, since you're the one that, that asked for this as to be an agenda item, but um, you know, uh, Lucy's conversation was uh, identified the executive finance and operation committees as potential locations that there could be standing agenda items to allow the COC to provide uh, feedback or comments during those meetings. So Lucy, with that. Uh, well, I, I, I think this fulfills the idea that we had that we would be a proactive organization. We certainly don't think that we know better than everybody else or that there isn't, there is already a lot of discussion and open, open consideration, but we thought that we could contribute, um, perhaps only occasionally. So the idea would be to have a standing item, which would be, um, allow anybody who had a concern or a comment to uh, raise a question. And I think the way it would work practically, Mark, is that whoever had that concern would raise at the beginning of the uh, and I we have to think this through but if if it was an item eight that the COC comment period came in and there were three items before that that were action items perhaps this the person could ask for the COC comment to come in before so that the comment could be made before action was taken it's it's uh, I'm not 100% sure of how it might work procedurally, but that way, at least the comment would have the issue would have been raised before a decision was made if it were a decision item. As I say, the, the chances of this happening are remote. Um, it's just that uh, at, so it would be the location on the agenda that would be an issue if it were right at the end. Um, it might be too late for the comment to have any um, any merit or to contribute anything. So um, having it as a standing item, I see it as mostly um, an answer, a question, a question would go out, you know, item seven, is there anything from the COC? The answer would be no. But if once in a while there was, perhaps th that could be moved ahead um, just so that the, it gets in before any decisions are made. But um, I think it does allow us the important uh, ability to raise a question and have a little bit of back and forth, uh, other than just being members of the public, which, as we know, um, have a limited uh, ability to um, ask a question and get a response, you know, have a conversation about it. So it seems to me like it, that it would be very worthwhile for us to have this ability, even, even if it's not used that often. Well, one of, the, one of the things I have to ask um, procedurally is how, how do we accomplish this? Do we go back to the board and ask them to always have a spot on the agenda for us? Not the board. I think we would have to, uh, we would ask Mark to ask uh, the individual committees whether this would be <coughs> that they would, how do you think it would work, Mark? <laughs> what, what is your suggestion? Well, I would, I think that we would need to um, have the process um, before we even go to the board or the, the committees for the exec finance and operations. I think the process would have to be very well spelled out because uh, um, uh, a concern I have is um, your bylaws state that no 
no member of the COC can speak for the COC unless authorized by the COC to say that. And so if you're commenting in live time to something that was discussed during the that meeting, mm -hmm. inquisitory, that's different, but making a comment, um, you could be violating your bylaws because you aren't, you were not um, um, empowered to speak for the COC. So I, I think that would be the trepidation that the committees may have unless you spell out that um, it would be your comments would be inquisitory in nature, or if it was something that had been, let's say it was in April, I'm going to pick a month, it was in April's meeting, mm -hmm. something piqued your interest, and you were able to agendize for the April um, COC, the COC discusses it and says, you know what, this is, this is our concern with this. And then it gets agendized for that May meeting for the COC to member to in, in that agenda item to express the COC's position on it. Well, that 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 would be uh, certainly one avenue, uh, which I think would be useful. The other would be to maybe call the agenda item COC member comment or COC member questions, um, so that it's understood that you're you're only speaking as an and then the person, as we've suggested, would have to say, "I'm raising this question not on behalf of the COC, but my own," uh, and explain themselves and that as, as we said this might completely satisfy the issue having had it raised and discussed and then that would be the end of it that thereafter if the, as you suggested if it is still opaque or not understood it gets taken back to the next coc full coc meeting for discussion so if, I, I think it just would be a question of phrasing what that agenda item is very carefully so that um, it was understood not to be a full COC um, opinion, so to speak. But we could work it out. Would you want to have this before every agenda item in which an action is taken or? No, I mean, it, it seems to me that it would be a standing item let's say we're well, item nine on every agenda and then but knowing that there's a, a, a decision being made at, on item two um it, it a request could be made to have the item nine moved ahead um or before item two gets discussed so that um the person can can address that their question before um the discussion takes place on the next on the action item I, guess. I, you know, I'm less familiar with procedure than you two are, but it, do you think that would work? Well, Mark, I'm just thinking out loud here. If nothing were changed, but you ch gave preferential treatment of some sort, probably bad phrasing, um, to members of the COC to be able to engage with the committee, but not in the same not with the same limits that you would place on a member of the public, you know, in recognition of the standing that the COC has, you know, where they would be allowed to engage in a dialogue much the way that staff would, rather than the typical three minutes and sit down type of thing. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's, it's the, for me, it's, and I think what the board members will be looking at is the ability for that individual member to speak with the voice of the COC as per your bylaws. And I think, I think, I think that could be a slippery slope. Well, uh, probably the only thing that a COC member would be allowed to do is to ask clarifying questions so that they can come back to this committee for discussion. And that is Correct. in our bylaws that way, yeah. that it would be yeah. questions. Yeah. And that, and, and I think the inquisitory nature is, is, is the direction to go. Mm -hmm. Unless it was already something as we just talked about earlier, unless it was already something that had been, the inquisitory started, right? In the April meeting, came to the April COC meeting. These, these are the questions I asked. These are the responses we got. How do we as the COC feel we need to respond to that? And then perhaps as the agenda item in the, in the May meeting of whatever committee, the, the position of the COC is expressed. Mm -hmm. Rebecca? 
So, um, Mark, are, are we thinking that in order to move forward with this idea, we would need to write it up and say, this is how we want to be able to do it and how we want it to happen in each of these committees and then take it individually to each committee? I, yes, I think, I think the process would need to be well spelled out. Do you think it would be best for, for you to broach the subject with, with uh, the committee chairs first, um, and then they could send back a message, we'd like it written out, we'd like, you know, has some kind of, um, you know, you could be the intermediary to let, let us know how they might like us to set this up. Well, yeah, I was, I've been putting some thought to that. Um, and, and I don't know if Larry, Man if we want to have Larry Manick express his thoughts yeah, before go I ahead, go ahead, Larry. I was going to say, because we're always getting the agenda and what the agenda item is, we know ahead of time, whether we're going to want to speak to something. So if there was a process where we could send a message ahead saying, we would like to address this item, um, that might make it, make it a lot smoother so that because these nine months that we've been doing this, very few of us has spoken in open time, you know, very infrequently. So I don't know how often it would actually come up. I, I, I agree with that. And um, however, I th with, you know, and we exceed the posting, we routinely exceed the posting time required. Uh, I, I shoot for 144 hours before the meeting rather than 72 hours. Um, but I, I, it, if I don't see following the Brown Act, how in that 144 hour period, the COC could gather because a, a poll via email would be, would be violating the Brown Act. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So th that, that is the difficulty I see in, in that. Um, as far as um, the question, how to present this for to the executive committee, finance and operations committee, um, I, I think Lucy be reaching out and 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 getting a, a pulse probably is what you're of the feeling and and then working closely with you guys to describe the process. But I think. Um, this could be a fantastic opportunity for to agendize it and have the COC present it to to the executive committee that they and 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 talk about um, the thoughts and the process and and hear it from from you guys. It's rather than hearing it from me. Okay. Um, well, it, it, in terms of this committee, this this committee could just call us special meeting where there's an urgency item and it would qualify under the Brown Act for that because a decision would have to be made before you know, the, actual, the other meeting came up. So if a quorum of this committee could agree on a date, it would just be a matter of, you know, say your availability, Mark, if I guess a special meeting had to be called, you know, for whatever, amount of time they, they want to put into it. So I don't really see that as an impediment. Um, I, I, I think going forward, if you think this is something that should, you know, members of the COC should present to the board and kind of get their feedback on it, you know, what would, what would you suggest? You know, Lucy, maybe a couple other people get together with you to talk about you know the mechanics of this um, yeah i think that would i think that could work and um then have you guys work as you know decide as from the coc standpoint yep we all agree on on this proposal this process and we agree on this person and this there are this group of people being the spokespersons to present to i i think it would just i think it Instead of me being a middle person, so to speak, I think hearing straight from the COC could be powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I guess Lucy, if you if you have a kind of a proposed 
or have some ideas in terms of how you want to present this, or maybe you want to discuss it some more, you know, we could just, I don't think we need a vote or anything, just pick a couple of people to work with you. And, uh, um, but are we going to have to take a vote to say that we would like to make this presentation to the board? Is that, is that an action we would need to take today? And are, and are we saying the, the board or? or oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. It's, is it the board or is it uh, the individual subcommittees? I have a feeling the board will want to weigh in on this. Okay. If, yeah, if Rebecca I'd, uh, had and Max and then Kingston. Okay. Uh, Rebecca, uh, did you have something? I I'm saw good. your hand up first. Okay, Max. Yeah, it, it sounds like um, we're moving towards a consensus here to uh, designate Lucy and and you know up to three others to come back and put this in writing um, and perhaps even you know some sort of PowerPoint or other presentation sort of uh, way of presenting to the board and then uh, bring that back uh, to our next meeting, uh, which we would then, you know, provide any edits if needed or, or else just uh, vote on it and then have the presentation the following. Does that seem to be kind of the direction we're heading in? I mean, I think it's a great idea. I think, you know, when we were working on the bylaws, uh, we talked extensively about this and how it might work or, or not work and decided to kind of push that off um, to a later date in terms of, terms of the specifics. But um, I think putting it in writing and, and having some sort of way of presenting to the board where uh, they'll appreciate it rather than, than see it as kind of a, a threat, so to speak, right, I think is the, is the key part. So seeing that and, and being able to all take a look at it, I think is important. Okay. Uh, Kingston, did you have a comment? And then uh, no, I agree. I was the same lines as Max was talking about. That's what I think you have to do. Okay, yeah. uh, Pat. Yeah, and and I um, agree, and I think that that is a good plan. I just I was going to say that I disagree with Larry in that just seeing an agenda item, we know we want to say something about that. That I occasionally in a meeting will hear something that makes me gasp, <laughs> and then I think that's when we want to be able to say, uh, you know, have you considered so-and-so or, you know, did I understand you correctly to say so-and-so? So it's not always something that we would know ahead of time that we're going to have a concern about, uh, but exactly how the mechanics work is going to take some work. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, who, who would like to work with Lucy just to uh, kind of tighten this up a little bit and then just bring it back to us next time and we'll just put it on the agenda. Max, if it's going to be a PowerPoint. <laughs> I guess if you want to go that far. Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, the writing, no, I'm not doing the PowerPoint. Turn it into a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no stack. All right, Jesus. <laughs> A, a one slide PowerPoint. You got it. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let's keep it simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I think I, th I think if we're presenting to the board, uh, having it very easily digestible, I think is the is the name of the game, especially if we're then taking it to the to the committees in addition, if we decide to go that route. So uh, happy to help on that. Um, I don't have a lot of time in the next month to, to have a lot of meetings on it, but um, happy to happy to help. There is one complexity, which is I'm going to be in England for the for three weeks, um, so I won't be back till the uh, the 20th of September. So we'll, we'll have, but well, we can do it in time. When's the next board meeting? When? Uh, well, that would we take it back to us yeah. first anyway. Yeah. yeah. Are we on the 22nd? 22nd, yeah. Or do we not do the? Lucy, let's just push it out another month, for God's sake, Lucy. If you're going to be in England, and and do we not meet on the last? Yeah, we meet after Wednesday, the board. which would be right. the 29th instead of the 22nd. Oh, okay, then there's time to do it. There's time well, to do it. All right. Okay. Well, the, the board was last week, so yeah, yeah that's right. But if, as long as we have time before our next meeting, then we'll have time to present it. To okay. And present it. Yeah. And even if it's just an outline, you can at least get some some feedback, and then. Yeah, 
and from there in terms of doing the finished copy. Okay. okay. It's the fourth, it's the fourth Wednesday. So the fourth Wednesday is the 22nd that month. Oh, it is. Uh, okay. Uh, Mark, does that sync up with our schedule? Because I know we had a standing fourth Wednesday, but we always wanted to meet after the board did. You're on mute, Mark. <laughs> it's not a Zoom meeting unless someone talks while they're muted. Um, it, yeah, the board is the third Thursday, so the fourth Monday does allow you to meet after the board and then meet prior to, and I think that one of the key points is, is it allows you to meet prior to the executive committee and still have time to get on the executive committee agenda if needed. Larry, 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 Larry you're muted. Uh, my, sorry, my dog was barking. Um, Al, yeah, Alfie was right. barking when he heard your dog barking. So. Um, my cat left. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I just wasn't sure how the, the days were lining up uh, because of the way that we had the five Wednesdays in um, in, in September. Uh, no, it'll still it'll still work out. OK, yeah, if not, we would just have to call a special meeting and cancel the regular meeting. Yeah, yeah. it'll work. Yeah. OK, good. All right. I don't think we need to take any action on, on this item. So um, I guess so who's have, who's do, who's doing it with Lucy? Uh, Lucy Kingston and Max. Thank you. All right. So that takes us down to um, anything else we want to discuss for the next meeting. You know, we're certainly going to keep this under consideration. If they're ready to talk about it, we'll put it on the agenda. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to the agenda for September? No. Okay. Uh, I guess didn't ask the last one. Last question uh, from the prior item, whether any members of the public were out there. Um, is there, I'll, I'll go back to that and see if anyone wanted to comment on um, what we're talking about in terms of putting together a process to suggest to the board on the COC's ability to give feedback at their subcommittee meetings. And Bruce does have his hand up and Bruce, you should be good to go here in a second. Okay, go ahead, Bruce, sorry. Just point of order, Lucy. Zoom works in England just fine. <laughs> oh, the hours are quite different, though. But, and yeah, Lucy, right. Lucy doesn't work just fine in England. <laughs> what is it now? About four in the morning or something? It's eight, eight hours ahead. Yeah. Eight hours difference. But you yeah. know, we could, if we, if we needed to, we could. So it's, yeah. it's not a problem. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> Any other comments from members of the public? I'm looking for uh, any real hands. Nope. Okay, so uh, just quickly go back to uh, any other agenda items. Uh, Want to suggest for next time? If you don't have anything tonight, you know, just feel free to email Mark, and you know, usually he presents uh, proposed agenda to Lucy and myself right before the meeting. Okay, um, seeing none, any, uh, Mr. Bartell, have any comments about our future agenda items? Looking for his hand and don't see it. Nothing there. All right, then um, who's gonna close us out? Move, move. All right, Larry and Kingston. Okay, this meeting is adjourned. Unless Good. there are any objections. See you die, all right, okay. All right. I'm Thank Have a great evening, well. everybody. See you next right. time. Uh, good good to see you. Right, bye. Mark, would you bye. stay on for just a second? Sure. I just have a uh, 